Hit caption. Um, so I guess um I'll share some information on NSA jobs and also internship. On February 28th, which is next week, they are going to have an info session uh, for the summer internship. Um, I know some of my students, I know Jose was, he applied and then a, a couple other students that got qualified for the internship program for the summer and they expect you to go to Maryland for the six weeks and you will be cleared um, by the NSA. So there are permanent position opportunity. Um, I will post some of that tonight when I get a chance to post it, push it through announcement for all my classes. So you will see that. Um, so check announcement for like internship and, and things like that. Okay. Um, so that's something that we are currently working on. And then I have a scholarship for Cal State San Bernardino. Um, they mentioned that and they have an info session in March. So I'll share some of that information as well. Okay, so for today, um, let me get to the classes on my laptop. We're going to go ahead and go through Unit 2. You can find um, the materials in your course on Canvas. Um, the, the notes are here, the assignments, so download the documents from these pages, and then the lab. Okay. I will post the videos um, tonight or tomorrow morning. So as soon as YouTube makes it available, I'll be able to link it to Canvas. So let me grab my files real quick. And then I'll share screen on Zoom. So that way we have the video. Okay, so um, I wanted to do a little bit of wireless today, but then I changed my mind because we just have a unit on the wireless attack. Um, and I wanted to show you how you should configure a secondary um, adapter interface to be able to perform this type of attack because, you know, you want to have your main interface for connections and community research and so on. Um, so we'll talk about the USB interface and all of that, but the majority of the things that we're going to talk about today is going to pertain to network scanning, um, identifying some vulnerabilities, and then potentially going into the attack scenario, which is the next phase. That's going to be the, the phase after we recon. So um, I want to introduce some of the tools to you because I noticed that some, I think the majority of you have seen Wireshark before or have used it before. Um, but in case you don't, we're going to have an exercise on it again today in both Windows and Linux. And then we're going to use a couple of the new tools and, um, for, you know, recon, for active recon. So um, as you go through the notes, it talks about packet sniffing. And this might sound like a review for many, right? But it could be new information for others. So um, let's just go through some information. Packet sniffing is really looking at what's being communicated between systems uh, from the sending system to the receiving system. From the time that you turn on your computer and it's detecting the network, there's some form of traffic being sent. We know that. Um, so using a network monitoring tool like Wireshark or other type of application, you're able to detect all the packets, which is what's being sent across, right? We know that when you are accessing websites or downloading, it's not just coming down as one packet, it's coming down as multiple pieces. So when it gets to your computer, your applica at application level, your browser or the type of application you're using, it's gonna reassemble all of your data together and present that to you. And when you learn the OSI model or the TCP IP model, it really addresses that. So in security, you really have to understand the protocols that you're working with, the network 
technology and standards that you're working with and how things communicate. That's really essential. Like I can't force that enough, right? Because a lot of the things that we're gonna look at is how system communicate and how weak the technology is implemented for the communication in pen testing. So um, it talks about how your data packets are being used and sent. And these data packets would have headers and footer, right? And then it would have some kind of body. Think of it like a piece of mail that you, uh, like a letter that you're writing, you put it in an envelope and then you send it to a friend. So on that envelope, you would have, you know, who you're sending it to, your address, who who is it from. Um, and then throughout with the post office, they'll be able to have some kind of tracking uh, ID for that particular mail article. So the system is kind of doing that. It's going to have header information where it's going to show which system is sending and which system is receiving. It's going to have some information about how big is that packet. Not all packets are the same size. So we want it to kind of be able, and then also the sequence number, which packet is going to be first and which packet is going to be last and so on. So in some cases, we would have multiple packets that are being sent. Now, in the form of attack, why is sniffing important? We use it to kind of sniff out the network to, to really see the protocols, the weakness in the protocol. But if you're looking at denial of service, you are going to see a flood, right? You're going to see some form of set of packets and it's going to come in groups and it's very large. Um, or in the, in the case of SYN attack, you would see that type of traffic. So we're going to touch a little bit on, on that today and what you should be looking for. Now, one of the things I wanna address is the legality of it, right? Because a lot of the time pen testing, we are kind of like at the border of what's legal and what's not legal, right? We don't do anything without authorization. I talked about this in my last class too, right? Make sure it's signed and witnessed, right? You make sure that you review the contract or the agreement, even in the fine prints, because that can hold you liable in the long run. So the legal of this is how you're using the data. Um, so if you're scanning the information and you're able to improve the network or use it for research purposes to conduct some kind of uh, you know, assessment for your network performance, it's legal. But if I'm an attacker, I'm sitting in my car, I'm connecting to your home network and I'm scanning you if it comes illegal because number one, I'm not authorized to do so. Second, right, because circumventing a network or entering, it's like, you know, when you're entering someone's property, that's not legal, right? So just think of it that way. When you are attaching to even a public network and you're scanning the activity on network and you are focusing particularly on the user that's uploading loading or downloading or processing a transaction, it becomes illegal. Unless the network administrator or that company allows you to do that, right? They hire you to do that and there's a written agreement between both parties. So here it talks about that. And a lot of this, the legality of things is like common sense. Um, so you have to ask yourself, you know, do if if you are the other entity, the person that's being scanned, do you want to be scanned? What kind of privacy are you dealing with? Is there any kind of legal liability that's going to be involved, right? So in the case of you scanning someone illegally, um, and if they find out, right, we can we can get into a lot of issues with, you know, uh, computer abuse, uh, regulation, and so on, and privacy, especially for California. Okay, so let's look at the assignment question. Well, the first question it asks you, why is packet sniffing important in pen testing and administrator? Uh, it really allows us from an administrator standpoint or you know, someone who's assessing uh, the network, it's really look, it's really allowing us to look at network vulnerabilities, what kind of weaknesses that we see. No network design is a perfect design. Uh, I don't care what engineers claim, right? Uh, a lot of the times when you are hired in organizations to do, you know, security jobs or network jobs or IT jobs, 
you are working with an existing network and possibly it's been designed for a long time, right? And a lot of times when they, they hire new people, they just implement out new solutions based on the existing network. They might redesign some segment um, in their infrastructure, but a lot of times they don't take down the majority of things because it still works. It costs money and time and effort, right? And then secondly, you know, you don't want downtime. So we want to look at the traffic flow. So it's like using the sniffer is like putting camera on the street, right? And watching all the cars go by. And, you know, in the case of security, we're going to take a look at that individual car, right? The packet or multiple packets. So let's say that you want to focus on your target, uh, like, for example, the red car that goes by. And you want to follow that particular target and see. So you can monitor the traffic flow. Um, ultimately, network performance can be assessed using sniffer or network monitoring tool. And, you know, from the security standpoint and networking standpoint, it's going to help you troubleshoot issues. And then improve network availability. And the A is part of the CIA triad. And so we want to always make sure that our network is 999979, right? 99.999999% availability. So that's important. Any questions? So the area of cybersecurity, right, you kind of see a little bit, and we tap into, as a professional, we tap into the administrator size as well. And then I addressed number two a little bit ago. So describe, uh, describe when packet scanning is legal or illegal. It's legal for administrators or the people who are maintaining the network and securing the network. because they are authorized to do so, right? That could be part of their responsibility in the organization. It is illegal when it is unauthorized. You. Oh, you're welcome, bye. So if I don't let someone in my house and they enter my house, right? That's not legal, same thing in your system and in your network. So let's take a look at one of the application that's very common in the industry, which is your Wireshark. This is an open source application. You can find the Wireshark on wireshark.org. It's freely available. You can download it for different platforms. So if we if you want to, you can visit the website and it will give you some information and there's some tutorials and um, I think they even have certification. So ultimately it is a program or a software that's allowing you to monitor your network or sniff out the packets. So when we say sniffing out the packets, basically we're exit. We see all the packets, all the communication that's being passed between with between the systems. And in the network, that could be a lot. It could be many systems that are talking at the same time. So when I'm visiting a website, I'm connecting to the web server, right? And I'm asking for the web server to, to give me a page. So that's a get request, right? And the web server is gonna give me the, could be an index page, the home page that's set. And then I'm on that website and I click on forms because I want to register for an account and I'm filling out the information. So that is a set task, right? So I'm setting some data and that's going to be stored onto their account database possibly. So that server is going to have to communicate back with me. And, you know, once I click submit the form, it's going to set the information. So with that, you see that when we're connecting to the wireless network or the wired network, we would be able to look at the packets and the services that's being used. Sometimes that could be a router, right? It's routing traffic back and forth. So the router's job is just to get your traffic to a particular network. So when I, my traffic is leaving here, RCCD, it gets to the RCCD border router or the edge router. 
and it's going to go to different autonomous system or other routers that's going to pass it, right? Could possibly be internet service provider and then across multiple network and it's going to get to my website could be google.com or youtube.com and so on. Okay. And then the same thing back. So what you will see today is when you look at Wireshark traffic, you're going to see all the activities from all could be the routing system, right? The, the switch system could be other systems that are connected in your network. So you can see everything. Now, based on that, we're going to capture, right? That snapshot of what we're taking from the network and we're going to narrow down on the things. And that's the harder part, right? That's the harder part to look at what's weak and what's a, what's vulnerable. And the attacker, they're going to look at that and they're going to say, oh, I'm just going to keep the scan and I'm going to look at the scan and I'm going to look at maybe they're using SSL, maybe they're using FTP, maybe, you know, I can capitalize on their DNS and so on, right? The more information you have, the more um, type of attacks that you can plan for um, as the pen tester or the attacker from that, you know, from the point of view of the attacker. So in sniffing, sometimes that could be a hardware device. You don't really see a lot of that now. I think some appliances, security appliances, you know, has that capability built in. Um, they do sell all-in-one devices nowadays. It has all the management capability. Uh, for example, if you're looking at, um, you know, some more advanced Cisco devices or Palo Alto devices, they might have that capability. But a lot of times when, when you know, for us to practice and for a lot of the administrator, they would use some kind of software tool, okay? Now, if it is a hardware device, it would have its own operating system because all of these are embedded systems. So when I say embedded system is usually we they use embedded Linux, very similar to what you see with like Debian base or some form of Linux, right? And when you run it, uh, you can run it in their command line interface. Um, or if it has a graphical user interface, you have a button and it would click. But there's an OS that's running in the back. It's called iOS. Just like how you would have it on your smart devices, like your Apple phones and so on, right? Um, so hardware, sometimes it is in command line and then sometimes you would see it with the graphical user interface. The newer ones tend to have that. Um, I think for most of our practice in school, we often use like things like Wireshark, which is hardware, uh, software based. So here are your categories of sniffing attacks, your passive and your active, right? Um, so with the passive, basically when you're running this, you're just kind of sensing out, looking at what's going on, like putting a camera on the street, right? Um, you're not really focusing on someone. Whenever that you have an active sniffing, we're going to do some of that today. What you would see is that you would you would be able to interact with it. That means that you can add in traffic. Traffic stuffing is, is very common in attack. So the whole point in it is due to do what? So if I, if I look at there's five packets that's going through, for example, for that system, um, I can add more to it, right? Um, to perform a certain type of attack. Um, or I can modify one of the packets to do man in the middle to redirect it. Um, you know, once I find out information about, you know, how their browsing session is, and then I would impersonate them. So there are, you know, often that you would see that sniffing is the beginning of other form of attack, and we're going to talk about that. And then when you, you often see why wireless uh, sniffing, that's important. Uh, because a lot of the times we talk about how wireless will be the weakness in your network. Um, so a lot, you know, even if they try to secure this, if you have a public section of your network, it has to be connected. And even if it's on a VLAN, right, a virtual local area network where they put a logical port connection to it, um, you know, VLAN escape is something that we can do. So if I can follow the traffic, I can get to you. Right, it's just a matter of time. So we wanted to, to
to make sure that we look at the wireless area and then they can also tap into your browsing history. A lot of it is coming for the web, right? Uh, web attacks is, you know, you can get session hijacking and all of these things. So your login credential and data. And then your JavaScript sniffing attack. And this is just to capture because JavaScript is often used for interactive form. Like whenever that you fill out registration form, uh, you click submit, uh, you'll be able to, to add or set data to the, the server. You would have some form of JavaScript because it's a common language to be used. And then you have, you know, session hijacking. So I, I can get, what do you get? The session ID, right? So whenever that you're visiting a secure website, a lot of the times your the system is communicating with you. And once that trust is created, so for example, like whenever I tell you a secret, uh, we are gonna agree on like a say or like some kind of code, right? Like I would say, okay, when you say this word, that means that we're talking secret. Okay. So the system does that. When it establishes the trust communication, it's gonna generate that session ID. And with that session ID, someone can scan you and they can capture that, right? And then I can take that ID and I can say that, no, not the other system. I now am the trust entity to your system, right? That's the point is to be able to get that trust by capturing that ID and impersonate your system. So here it talks about that and that's called hijacking, okay? So in order to become you, right, I have to tell the other system that I'm you and how can I do that, right, by the section. They can also capture password information because there are things that we can pass that is not secure. So let's say that you're inputting password into some kind of unsafe website that can clear text, right? They can pull that from, from the, the actual scan. And then, to be able to use your password and impersonate you, okay? And then DNS poisoning is just to be able to get the DNS record and then modify it to redirect you to their site or to poison the DNS for other reasons. So um, this is very close to farming and often that you see that, you know, to get you to enter your credential by going to a fake site. Sometimes this comes with phishing attack. Sometimes, a lot of the times, it's man in the middle and other form of attack like hijacking. Okay. So you have to see that if they're spear phishing, if they're spear phishing executives, likely that they would have other form of attack that's coming along. And some of it stem from sniffing. We're going to use a tool for our sniffing today, uh, Net Discover is one of the ones that is often used for ARP sniffing. So address resolution protocol is used um, in network all the time, right? It's allowing the system to correlate the network address, which is IP, to the actual system address, which is the MAC, the media access controller address. So that's how it's able to correlate that, right? With the, with the ARP table, so when it's they sniff it out, they can see which system is which, and then they would use the IP address for spoofing or the MAC address for spoofing, okay? And then DHCP, this, it talks about how when you're using DHCP, it assigns IP address, but in a snooping attack, they would set up a fake DHCP. So at home, your wireless router is a DHCP server. It gives out an IP address to you when you connect to it, right? But let's say that if I'm a, I want to attack you, then I or your you know every anyone in your home, I would set up a rogue DHCP. So whenever that they're trying to connect to you, to that wireless, and I I also have to do a a replay attack, right? Um where I'm pretending to be that router and I'm giving out that DHCP. So the snooping attack is really making a rogue DHCP and then lure everybody to use it and then be able to do something else with it. So here you can use it to flood. You can, you can set up multiple IP addresses. 
until you know the other and then eventually get rid of the other DHCP. Okay. Now there are ways that we can detect rogue uh, systems that are coming up. There are security tools to be able to do that. Okay. Any question? Okay, so I think we addressed four. We talked about active and passive sniffing. So passive sniffing captures the network traffic that the device is connected to. Passive sniffing is difficult to detect. The main, that's the main difference, right? So when I'm connecting to a certain part of the network, I can scan everybody on the network and that's passive. But in an active sniffing, it requires overcoming network security barriers, but, and then you want to also generate traffic or modify traffic. So there's ways to be able to, you know, change the way the traffic is routed uh, and so on. So active sniffing is visible to detection. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so if I want to just see what's going on in my network, I would do a passive sniff, right? You know that. For the active sniff, um, I, I want to do a packet stuffing. Um, so let's say I wanted to perform a denial of service attack where, um, you know, I would generate lots of packets and be able to send it what, when, when a certain system is send, sending, right? Like I'm saying, okay, well, when that system A is sending, I'm just gonna generate additional packets with that. So that way, you know, it might reduce the availability of system B who's receiving the traffic. Yeah. So the detection for A for, for active is more apparent. And so how can they bypass that? By spoofing, right? We just talked about that. By impersonating another system in the network. So if I'm pretending to be system A, I have to spoof its IP address and map. So that way it looks legitimate that system A is generating all of that traffic. So for five, we're gonna look at the scenario. And then we're gonna determine the type of attack. So for A, a hacker is connected to a wireless access point, the AP, and performs a scan on the network. This is passive. We didn't say whether it's legal or illegal, right? It's passive and it's call wireless sniffing because it's wireless access point. B, a hacker is scanning users' network web connection and activities in interactive online forms and obtain private data and credential information. Number one, it's active because they have to do additional tasks to communicate with that system to be able to obtain credential um, and do other things, right? Um, it can be used because it is interactive web sessions. It's browse, browser history sniffing. So they also have to look at, you know, specific system browsing history. And it doesn't have to be that I have to be on that computer and look at the browser history that what we see in Chrome or, or, or Firefox, right? Browsing history just means that we're looking at traffic because how can I tell? Well, Google has a certain public IP address. So if the, that particular system is visiting Google all the time, then it should show up, right? So you can filter that out and take a look. Or a certain other system would visit a certain other website to, to process, you know, payments for invoices and so on, then it would show up with that particular IP address. And that's how you can do browse, browser sniffing. It's not necessarily looking at the browser history in the application, but looking at the type of traffic that is to that destination for the web server. Understand? Any questions? Okay. And then because it's interactive, it's also JavaScript sniffing. Okay. So it's also good to learn JavaScript. I mentioned that already, right? In this field, because you're gonna work with a lot of assessment. 
And then for C, um, it says hacker performs the network scan to get the user's session ID on an e-commerce website and uses the ID to access authorized data such as shipping addresses. So if the user is trying to, um, you know, use Amazon, for example, and make a purchase, right? Because it is secured and it's authenticated, it generates some kind of trusted session between Amazon and that user. Um, and then they can, the session ID can be captured. But with that, they also have to decrypt some of the things because it's using, uh, it's using encryption for the authentication process. So they have to perform a session hijacking. So, and other things. <laughs> that that is a really simple statement, but with that, you have to perform multiple attacks. But it would start with a session hijack. A hacker sets up rogue DHCP server by flooding the real one with multiple requests of IP addresses to occupy the legitimate DHCP server. Then the user packet sniffer to use the packet sniffer to monitor the network activity. We learned that this is DHCP snooping and sniffing. And then the last scenario, E, a hacker intercepts data packets and sends false messages. Oops. On the network, redirecting traffic away from the user's IP address to fake website and trick the user to enter login credential. So there are multiple here, right? As I mentioned earlier. So this is um, so you know, it would go right after the the session hijack. So they would need to do a man in the middle. So that's an you know, the keyword there is intercept. So whenever that you see that in the attack, that's man in the middle. And then they need to do an ARP sniff because they need to lure the traffic away. So that means that they have to spoof uh, IP and MAC. And then the DNS poisoning because they are redirecting. So some of the keywords that come up in scenarios when you're looking at attack, it's pretty, it's pretty obvious which attack they're performing. Any question? Easy peasy, right? Slowly, we will do all of these. Okay. So we already talked about, um, so we, let's wait, let's wait on these. So I put a little bit of, you know, the defense tactic in here because from a professional security standpoint, we also need to think about like, how can we reduce the gap in the security landscape, right? And in the area of the network, um, patching and updating is important. The endpoint detection, like who's who, this, entails more than just identifying the system. This ties back to the physical physical port and connectivity of that system. And even on the wireless, you can Mac filter, you can do a lot of things. So when I have a desktop, my desktop has an ethernet cable that's connecting to the switch. You can also associate, right? which MAC address is at that physical port so that way in case someone plug in there, right? So endpoint detection is a lot more than just doing inventory and identifying the system and then having the response. And this is for the management and security. Having that is essential. Um, simulation of attack and pen testing. This is why ethical hackers and pen testing job is high demand because it is needed at least once a year if not every six months, right? Um, Multi-factor authentication, this can be overrided fairly quickly now, right? As you can see, uh, but, and then train the users, implement VPN, and the list can go on and on because it's, you know, we want to have um, an overlapping plan. So here are the seven steps in recon. We're gonna spend a lot of time doing this, okay? So that way we can do these things easily. 
So that means that you want to collect the initial information that kind of build out a little bit of goals and plan, your scope, um, determine your network range, likely that you got some systems connected to the network somehow, right? Identify all the active machines, that's easy. So we can do that today. Who's connecting and who's talking and what they're, are they doing? And then access points and open ports. We did this last week, right? And Matt will tell you everything that you need. And then your access point. Um, I was going to do Airmon today, but I want to save it for the wireless chapter. So we will we will do some like a pure wireless and maybe a little bit of Bluetooth attack um, by that point. So in a, in a few weeks. And then fingerprinting OS, we saw some of this from Nmap last time. Uh, discover services import and map and also today you're going to see some of that from uh, the network monitoring and scanning and then mapping the network so the cool thing on wireshark is now it has the map capability so when you're scanning and, and you're looking at specific server so for example i'm looking at all my dns server there's a map feature on wireshark you can click it and it's able to give you the visual, right? But when they're saying mapping, it's really mapping out like system to IP and then the resources and the services. So what I like to do is I have an Excel spreadsheet. <laughs> I'm old school. And I type out system ID number, like computer name or host name. It's IP address, it's MAC address, what kind of protocols it uses, um, that ties to the services, what ports it use. And I keep that list. So if I have certain amount of time to look at my target, I keep identifying all the active system that way and I can go back and forth. And then using uh, some type of list like that, you can quickly search. That makes your life a lot easier, right? So just streamline the process in doing an inventory and then associating that system and who it's connecting to and what kind of ports is important in this industry, okay? Um, so if you're doing incident response and, and or pen testing, um, that's a recommendation for me. Any question? Okay, so here are your goals. So let's answer some of the question. So number six, it says when performing recon off the network, what is the step after information has been collected to determine IP address range? You need to find the active system, who's talking, who's communicating, right? Who's Who are using services? And then fill in the blank. It says UN or A blank is a program designed to find and take advantage of security flaws. That sounds like a threat, right? <laughs> the first part. Or vulnerability in an application or system, typically for malicious purposes. And that's exploit. Now, that's different than a threat in how, in the definition. The threat, it, it would take advantage of the security flaws and the vulnerability, but it would cause damage, right? So like a virus or an attacker, right? They would use the vulnerability to be able to attack your system and then maybe take data or cause some kind of damage, corrupt your system and so on. So how can you find exploits? Let's say that you are working with different types of systems and you have to learn about new exploits. So for all of us, right, for all of you here, um, if you want to know about exploits because you're new, you can go to databases and there are many in the notes. I give you some of the common ones that you would see. And that could be from various vendors. There are exploits that are particular to Google. There are exploits that are particular, you know, Rapid7 keeps a list. There are many different vendors. A lot of the security vendors or even Metrain, you know, things like that, they would have, organization would maintain some of this. So your exploit DB, 
it's so nice now because they have managed and centralized a lot of these things. Back in the day, you have to go to the forum, bless you, discussion posts, threads to kind of comb it out, right? Uh, you go and you post, you're like, oh, I'm dealing with this. Anybody knows how to be able to address this? And someone who are experienced with it, they would respond, right? So now it's a good way to centralize the resources and share the resources to the world. But, you know, by regulation, some of the vulnerabilities, right? Uh, we know that it has to be listed and make known, especially software and hardware vulnerabilities. And then the common vulnerability and exposures, which stands for CVEs. I know some of you know, learned this from CIS 27 or learning it now. They maintain databases, Microsoft has one. Um, there are centralized one for the industry. There are many, so I'll come back to the notes and show you where you can find that information. So technology vendors um, or you know manufacturers, um, even the hardware ones, they have that. Okay. So if you were in my class last night, we'll look at this the VU for the CVE from Microsoft and others. And then there are ways for you to be able to report export too. So some of these databases has the capability of you to fill out information, put in some link information and then submit, and then they will review it, right? And then they will add in additional documentation for it. So it's a good way for us to kind of go to one resource or, you know, or common resources to be able to find information. So as you can see, right, this is always changing. It might be like this one month and more additional information. So you have to keep up with it and you might be dealing with different exploits. Okay, so it's kind of good to learn and understand the specific, but sometimes organization would focus on what's needed for their operation. Okay. So here there are recon goals um, and then we touch on the recon tool. Some of it you've seen from the last set of notes from last week. And then, um, you know, I just wanted to bring this back, my favorite. That's for browser exploit. Uh, I like doing web app stuff, so it's really interesting to me. So exploit definition is here for the other questions that we went over. So you can find that on the notes. And then there's your exploit DB. So these are some of the common ones that you see, but there are more. Okay. And then the CVEs databases. I like using Mitre, and then there are vendor specific, but you can also rely on NIST, which is what a lot of professionals use. Um, and then you can go to the specific, like Microsoft has, Cisco has, um, anybody that produce technology equipment or software, they would document their CVEs and publish it. And then you would be able to find, um, you know, also on Mitre and attack. There is some information, but if you go here, so let me click on it so you can see. So they have news information and then you can also, you know, find, locate CVEs. And then one of the things that's interesting is your packet storm security. This website gives you security tools, exploit, and advisories. It's maintained by uh, packet storm themselves, but security professional contribute to it. So basically, they're just a bunch of security professional that really love this stuff. And then they add the tools and the things that you need. So one day, you'll be able to contribute to some of these things or, you know, contribute to this and so on. So for question nine, oh, 
website. For question nine, it asks you what type of websites current, uh, current and historical compute uh, provides current and historical computer security tool exploits and security advisories. You can go to Packet Storm Security. Okay, for ten. We need to identify the vulnerabilities based on the description that's given. All of the, you know, protocols were designed in the 70s and sometimes 80s and 90s. Um, all the design have flaws. And even sometimes they have to upgrade it to different version or a variation of it that has secure component. So whenever that you deal with protocols, that would tie to a service that the system use, you would, you would, you know, look at its information, research it, and possibly there's exploit capability with it. So, you know, this is part of gathering intelligence, right? A, Windows Transport Protocol often used for file sharing, printer sharing, access remote services with Port 139, SMB, server message block. You guys use this before? No. You use Zoom? No. I'm using Zoom now, right? You know, whenever you, you allow people to attach a file to share, right? In chat, you seen that? So there are a lot of services that use this SMB, media-based, common, okay? So the common port that's used is 139. There's uncommon ports that are used by administrator, but often if you see it pop up as 139, it's often SMB. B, client server model architecture using separate control and data connections between the client and server. This is kind of vague. Uh, it should be used for, I meant to put down file sharing, but somehow I forgot to add those things. <laughs> Separate control data connections. For file sharing between client and server. So that's your FTP. There are still many FTP servers out there. So whenever FTP is being used, so FTP servers, people just upload the files on there for others, right? You see education institution like UC Berkeley and um, or even Mozilla has FTP um, for the user. The, the thing with FTP is if you're using FTP, they can access it anonymously, so you can't really track like, who's doing what. Uh, you can use SFTP, secure FTP. Um, that's for security plus class, right? <laughs> or certification. And that will require you to set up user accounts, login and permission for the type of files that they want to share. Um, so ideally, if you have some form of, you know, repository for your files, you need to really control access for it, right? But whenever that you have FTP, you are vulnerable. So look for that when you're a pen tester. Look for SMB when you're a pen tester. Everybody uses Exchange Server because that's how we can get mail to the employees. Um, mail server application, that's used to send, receive, and relay outgoing mail. So your your mail server doesn't doesn't necessarily send and, and receive, right? It all it can be an uh, the middle guy to forward to other servers and then get there. Um, case example is your Gmail. Gmail has many relay servers in between. Uh, that's how Google is able to support thousands and millions of users where you would have different servers that communicate. So every time that the server is passed, it gets added to the header. So that way they can track like which server was involved in the transaction of that particular mail piece. So simple mail transport protocol, SMTP, RCCD uses SMTP, everybody uses SMTP, it is vulnerable. 
And often you see this as port 25. This uh, Windows system using Win to translate host names and IP addresses. If you took my class for 40A, 27A, you've done server setup like DNS. And at the end of the DNS installation, it asks you, do you want to install Wind? Most people click yes and next, right? Automatically, what does it do? It takes the computer name and it uses that to be able to identify the system on the network. Back in the day, we don't have IP addresses to work with. When I first entered the field, there was not IP addresses until a year later uh, that they implemented it. So what we did was we would set up unique computer names, right? Now you your OS actually generated it. So when you look at your computer name, it has you know the default manufacturer information. You can modify it. Um, and then in order to add the system to the network, what you would do is you would have a server-based system and it would recognize each system by the name, not the IP addresses, right? So WINS allows you to be able to translate those names to a, a, an IP address equivalent. So that way you can connect those. Well, why do people use it if it's so vulnerable? Well, because you have legacy systems out there. For example, a school that's been around for 150 years, they have databases of transcripts and things from students from way back in the day, right? And that needs to be connected somehow because one of their graduate might need a transcript from, I don't know, uh, 1920s, okay. And the 1920s record was scanned and put it into a, a 1980 computer and that is still connected. So legacy system is still around. We can't do away with those. Not everybody migrated into cloud-based virtual machine or some form of simulator with that particular application because they're afraid that if they turn down that system, the records are gone. And you see that with hospital, with school, with a lot of things. Data retention is a big deal and it's also our fault, so. Question. Okay, um, so that brings us back to the DNS poisoning. So what type of attacks entail fake information being entered into the cache of the domain name server resulting in DNS queries producing an autocorrect reply sending the users to the wrong website, that's DNS poisoning. But DNS poisoning can be other things. A lot of the times it's a redirection because a web server must connect to a DNS server, a domain, right? You hear people say, oh, I have a website. I host my domain with so-and-so, right? So your, your domain name system contain records and those records can be modified or the cache can be modified. We, we talked about combating it with DNSSEC and other things. Um, and then the method of attacks that would consist of adjusting server configuration to direct the users to malicious site is call hijacking the DNS or DNS server hijacking. I mean, there are phishing tools that already have this capability built in. So you just fill out some information like what does your phishing link you want to look like, right? Like win $100,000 and so on. So it creates a message for you. It generates a link and then with that link, you just put in the public IP address of your server and it's going to take you, you know, the user there. And then on that, you want to overlay it with a, a some kind of form, having them fill out, you know, oh, if you want to win a thousand dollars, fill this information out, give me your account number while you add it so I can transfer the money to you and so on. Or log into Amazon because you're shipping package is missing, right? That's a big tricky one. Was it that uh, this lady on the news, some sort of government official said she got tricked and was giving out $50,000? <laughs> yeah. IT people too. <laughs> I, you know, plenty, yeah, I wouldn't doubt it. 
fifty thousand dollars is not bad actually. There are people who lost a lot more money. Yeah. Yeah, I remember when they called me, they were like, Yeah, your Amazon package is misplaced. Can you give me information? I said, Can I get your number to call back? You if you say that, they usually hang up because they don't have a number for you to call back. So <laughs> or you just block. Okay, so the purpose of DNS poisoning is mostly, right? This is more of a the overall catch-all answer, steal data. Sometime that could be infecting it with malware. So if they are redirecting you to a water hole, aka malicious website that would embed with different things, right? Um uh that would be infecting your system with malware, sometimes ransomware. Some of it could be halting security updates. So just keep making sure that you keep those systems vulnerable for a certain amount of time that you need as an attacker, right? And then just to censor web access. So I would tell you where to go based on where I'm gonna direct you to go. You can't just go wherever you want to go. <laughs> Question. So as you read the book, it just gives you scenario and example. I'm actually leveraging between three or four textbooks. Um, I'm I'm using a, an ethical hacking study guide book along with another book. I subscribe to PACT. Um, I was talking to a student yesterday. I really like PACT. They they produce a lot of really good technical books and they have valid like exercises within it. Uh, I sometimes use their exercise. Sometimes I just like, sometimes I write my own stuff because I can, I, I read their exercise. I want to get an idea of what they're using and what will be relevant. Sometimes I, you know, but um, if you want PACT subscription, usually it's like a hundred dollars. Sometimes they have a sale and you have access to all their books and Jason Dion videos are on some of their books. So I, I think they're using a lot of Udemy content as well in some of their books um, from Python programming to, you know, other languages to a, a lot of security books are written with PACT publish, publication. Um, so it is a useful uh, subscription if you want to learn new things. All right, so these are some network-based vulnerabilities. We talked about WINS. Uh, there's link local multicast name resolution. This is um, for IPv4 and IPv6 hosts, so your version 4 IP address and your version 6 IP address to name resolution for DNS packet. If you don't have a DNS, you often see that they're using link local. Um, some of the switch has this capability to incorporate the more advanced level switch um, but you would see this in Windows version Vista later. I often say that this is a forgotten version of Windows because it has so many problems that they kind of did away with it very quickly. Um, you know, Vista is, they stopped supporting that a long, long time ago. So the seven now, right? But um, if you run into that, and then even the later version, sometimes they use this LLM and R. And then Linux uses um, a system configuration setting for LLMNR. And then for SMB, it also uses port 445. For simple network management protocol, do you know what this does? If you took networking, you should know what that does. Simple network management protocol. What do you think it does? I had, if you took my network class, you installed this. I know you did. Yeah. What did you say? Who's on the network? What? Yeah. So basically they use it 
That's correct, to see which systems are connected to the network, okay? And so before we type it in, so let me finish that part. SNMP is really important, why? Because things like um, you wanted to check to see who's on so that way you can push updates. If you have a thousand computer on there, I don't think you want to go and ping a thousand of them, right? Uh, even if you automated that script, I really don't want, uh, you know, four packet per ping on Windows, that's going to be a while, okay? So this protocol allows us to look at the device that are connected to the network. It also is useful when you're doing vulnerability assessment, but the older version of it has some security issues like password being clear text. So when you're using SNMP, when you're setting this up on, most of the time you see this on layer four switch routers and so on, make sure that your secret is strong. That means your password for fast phrase and make sure that you use SNMP version two or later. I would say the current is like three, I think. But if you're using version one update, okay. And some devices only support version one. So what does that mean? We have to upgrade the device to get the software that it needs. And so that's money, right? Uh, okay. DNS poisoning information is here. Cash poisoning, pass the hash, right? PTH. This Exploit authentication tool, hash is used for your password storage purposes. So in on number 14, in Windows, what type of attacks targets NT LAN manager authentication system? And if you took my 27, and some of you are in that class this semester, you will do brute force, right? If you, if you ever use pain enable, you have used NTLM manager. And that's how you're able to do force because basically it's looking at the hash and be able to get your password or go to the hash and, and find your password. So earlier, I think last time I mentioned that, you know, I don't want to spend the time to brute force your 12 character password. That could take years, right? Maybe if my system is super powerful, that might take months. Okay, but what I can do is I can use other tools to be able to get your password or even take the hash of your password. And even if they claim the password is encrypted. <laughs> so password is no go for me. I, d I really don't like the password. There's like, and people have to remember password. It's such a huge flaw. Yeah. A hash is a value that's generated for your password storage or file storage. So whenever that you save a file, it generates that string, numbers and characters. So when your password is created, it creates a password file. And that password file has that hash value. And it uses the hash for encryption purposes. So when they say that, let's say your password is 83, it will convert it to, you know, an encrypted hash, like symbols and letters, right? But it's always going to refer to that hash for the original file. So in order to get your original password, I just need to go to the hash. And then some encryption algorithm is a little weaker than others and so on. So, um, you know, security solutions is as good as, it could get and also how you implement it, how you use it. Um, so the two things that you need to remember for man in the middle, most of us already know that it's an intersection, right? So if I'm, if you are talking to your friend secretly and I'm in the middle eavesdropping, listening on, on your conversation and performing man in the middle, right? 
But normally this attack is do it, we're gonna use it in addition to other attacks. Um you know, one of my ears should be uh, what am I listening in for? What am I, you know, am I going to pretend to be you? Am I going to impersonate you? Um, so interception is one of the big area for, for man in the middle. So we want to scan the traffic to intercept the traffic. And then with that, you have to use decryption because now you have to decipher the secret. What you know, because the system have trust and they communicate with encryption, so you have to decrypt without the other would know, right? So, with that, we have to spoof and so on. So I think I put down what part is what attack belongs to interception and what attack belongs to decryption. Because sometimes when you read these things, you're kind of, you kind of get it all mixed up. You're like, wait, relay and replay, right? So the type of, of attacks that, is, that can be performed in the first phase of man in the middle, hence interception, is the replay attack. Data is intercepted, altered, and forwarded to the destination. It could be their intended destination. The relay attack communication with both parties are is initiated by the attacker who then merely relays the message to the destination without manipulating them or even necessarily reading them. Because the traffic has already gener been generated originally by the attacker, they don't need to alter it. So let's say that you want to, you, you are system A and you want to send to system B, right? I'm in the middle, system C. System C is just going to generate the traffic to system B and say, hey, I'm system A. Send it back to me, right? So in that case, and then send the system A, system, pretend to be system B, right? So in that case, you, you have the interception in the relay. You relay messages as the middle point. And then for the decryption phase, which is phase two, these are the type of attack. And I'm only listing the three that's common, but you can find others. HTTPS spoofing. So with that, I would send a phony certificate to the browser. And once that, because of the certificate, it's gonna say, oh, I trust you, then the connection is made, right? Remember we talked about certificate, it's just a file that would state, right? The type of permissions and the trust and so on. And then you have SSL Beast. Beast stands for Browser Exploit Against SSL TLS. Basically, in this type of attack, the script intercepts encrypted cookies sent by the web application and compromise CBC, which is cyber blockchaining, for cookies and authentication token decryption. And CBC is used for cryptocurrency. People used to argue all the time that CBC is very strong and secure, right? Nothing is 100% secure. So if the cookies are encrypted for that web application, it could be compromised through SSL piece script.
most websites transition completely to TLS. There are some that's still using SSL, but secure socket layer is SSL. To hijack, they would forge or make a fake set of keys that would then pass to the user application because in or you know with secure communication encrypted keys are used for encryption and with that it would generate the handshake and tcp does the three-way handshake it acknowledges and and then sync So it looks like it's secure, but it is not, right? And normally with the SSL hijacking, you also have a redirection as well. So Pentest Plus expect you to know these attacks, the protocols vulnerability, like which protocol, like what we've seen with the scenario, right? And then the phases of attacks um, along with, you know, like the, the stages within man in the middle and so on. So make sure we know. Okay, so after you go through and look at some the man in the middle attacks, it will get to it will talk about downgrade attack. And to find this information, you have it on your notes. So if you guys want to grab it or summarize it, that's right here. Okay, so I put everything down for you right here. So the SSL stuff um is on page six. The relay and replace on the same page. And then the ones that I didn't mention is the stripping, which is kind of like HTTP uh, spoofing. It's the same. And then your downgrade attack, it is part of this. So it forces a, a type of connection and then you would see different name for the attack. There's Poodle, which is padding Oracle downgrade legacy encryption attack. And this is for SSL socket layer, uh, for the layer and then version three. TLS, it's, no, it's not available, so it's only using SSL. You got Freak, which stands for factoring RSA export keys vulnerability. It forces the client system to use weak encryption with the data communication because when you send data uh, for a secure website, let's say I submit a form and I type, your data is stream and it uses stream encryption. That means one bit at a time versus block because block takes a long time. So we have to push it fast. Okay. And then log jam. So as you go through this, you can see Vulnerability with RSA, right? RSA is used in a lot of things. And then browser exploit against SSL and TLS. That's the beast. We saw that earlier. And then sloth is here. So it says sloth attacks allow a man in the middle to force web browser relying on old weak hash algorithm. So sometimes, right, we always harp about, oh, update your stuff, right? Because the a lot of it is for security reasons. So for question 18, it says, what type of downgrade attack consists of forcing web browser to rely on old? When we caching algorithm, it will be your security losses from obsolete and truncated transcripted cache because the old browser uses that. almost done and then I'll let you take a little bit of a break
And I'm going to do the lab. So we're not performing attack this week. So this week is still recon week. Um, and then going into next week, we're going to do a little bit of attack. We're going to go through different types. So I want you to kind of know more about scanning tools this week for your network. We're going to use Wireshark because it's, it's common. It's easy to use. Any questions? Okay, so 19, it asks you, what type of denial of service attack? So DOS stands for denial of service attack. When we, we learned that this type of attack, right, make the service or the system become unavailable whenever that it's requested. A lot of the time when you see this with web server where it would floor the web server so it's not responding to other client systems that are requesting for the page to be served. Or in other cases, it could be, you know, a firewall, a router, a lot of things. But for the denial of service attack, a lot of the time, they just send continuous requests to the target. To take the attention away from the other system. So that way, in it would not complete the connection with a three-way handshake. So the three-way handshake for TCP does what? The first thing it does is say, hey, are you there? Right, whenever two systems trying to connect, system A is gonna say, hey, system B, are you there? And then system B would say, hey, I'm here, I'm available. And then system A would say, hey, let's connect. And then system B said, done, right? So with that, it needs to have acknowledgement and synchronization. TCP takes a little bit longer than UDP. UDP just sends, doesn't matter. But if you're not there, oh well, right? You get it later. But the system for TCP, there's acknowledgement so that way the communication is set. So you would have SYNAC. And denial of service attack, take advantage of that would do a SYN flood. So I'm requesting, I'm requesting, I'm requesting, I'm requesting, I'm requesting, right? <laughs> All right. So before 20, let's come back here. There's that section for DOS on the bottom of seven. This has been around for a long time. Now, one thing I want to point out that in pen testing, denial of service attack is not denial of service attack. So when we practice that as a pen tester, it's called stress testing that means that you want to take your system to the max you guys ever stress test your cpu at home <laughs> right like you try to overclock it or turbocharge it until it's kind of almost maxed out but not kill it right so we wanted to see how far our system can go before it goes down or when it goes down and you do this so you kind of know what to expect when they do a denial of service attack like you're on your web server or your DNS or, you know, whoever. So one of the common attack, you hear this a lot. I talk about a lot of this because it's been around forever, smart. You can ping someone to death, right? There are scripts, even, you know, some of the available, publicly available scripts, you can send, you know, n number of ping at once. So, and you can write that in Python or, or shell, pretty easy. I want to send, activate this service. This is the destination address. So plug that into the parameter and I want to loop it. And each time that it sends, let's say a hundred ping, right? Every time it the, the system is pinging, basically it's saying, are you there? 
there at that destination, the other one would say, I'm here, right? It would need to re reply. So in Windows system, it pings. Whenever you send a ping, it sends four packets. But in Linux, when you ping, it just continue until you stop it, right? Pinging is used for testing connectivity. So sometimes, you know, administrator would turn off ping. When I was an administrator, I turned off ping. I think most people don't need to ping unless we service. Ping, application. ping. yeah, we use ping in, in, so if you guys do this, go to CMD and then you can ping yourself, ping 127.0.0.1. Chat address for everybody? Yeah, it's loop back. It's your system address. It's basically how it sees itself. It's a loop back address. You scored my thought. Yeah. And then you can ping your regular address too. Come back to Mandela. Can you wipe off the administrator? Hmm? Can you take the administrator off your computer? Come back to Mandela. Yeah, you can. Well, if you're an administrator, you can remove other administrator. Come in command prompt. Yeah. Yeah, user add, and you can change user account. That's easy in Windows. But you have to be an administrator or a user that has that privilege to do that, yes. How do you get the privilege? How do you get the privilege? Well, you get the privilege when you create that account. If your account is a regular user, you you have limited privilege or user rights. That's what Windows call it. But if you if you... You know, when you first buy your computer, it asks you what user account you want, right? A lot of the time system will give you the user account. The administrator is hidden in the background, but it throws you into a certain group membership. However, you know, you when in a in an, an enterprise environment, you create the user and you would put them in different groups. Windows have built-in groups like administrators, users, you know, power users, and so on then you would put them into appropriate group that would have inherited rights. It's kind of like, you know, you own land and you have children and you would say, you know, the government by the law says that, you know, something, if you can pass down your land to your children, your family. When you put things into container, it inherits the rights of that container by default. But you don't have to make it like that. You can have different association with membership. That's a different class, but overall, we have to learn that concept on how container works in security. It doesn't feel like your head's going to explode with all this information. No, I love it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's a lot. So we have to be to the point where if someone says something, you know it, right? You will be like, oh, I know that. I can give you the answer for that right now, right? So when you, you know, in and that comes with time and experience and knowledge and, and practice. So, you know, as you move along, you're gonna be like, oh, I learned this new thing and then you practice it and you know it well, right? Okay, network access control your net. This is a way that you can identify your devices by ID. Um, but it also check for the health of the system. Remember, I think I mentioned this in one of my classes that if I was you, every time that you connect to my wireless network, I wanna make sure that you have antivirus and so on, right? You see this in a lot of the environment to make sure that you're not bringing in unwanted things, okay? Uh, it's kind of like you're at the border, you wanna cross the border to the country and they wanna make sure you have back the proper vaccine. Right, so your system will bring in specific things that could be not wanted to the network. So you want to be able to check that. But um, a way to bypass that is to pretend that I am the authenticated system <laughs> by getting your credential, by having that particular trust or session, right? And then we can also do VLAN hopping this is to attack network resources to gain access to traffic through the VLAN. Okay, so you guys know what virtual LANs are? Some of you know, right? We learned that in networking. Huh? So you can use 
a physical port and then make it into multiple virtual networks and you can configure that on network devices, right? I can make, depending on the network device, I can make VLAN 1, VLAN 2, and VLAN 3. VLAN 1, I can use it for the finance department only. VLAN 2, I can use it for, I don't know, marketing department only, right? So each of these departments have kind of like a segregated sub-network within my network, but using the physical ports. And sometimes it's limited to like the type of port. Okay. So a good way to really isolate the network logically is to use VLAN. That's the practice, right? People used to say, oh, you know, easy, throw it on a VLAN. Like this lab right here when I first came and I was like, okay, this is what I'm going to do at NBC. Be ready. <laughs> and so I want my student, you know, to send like, you know, to practice these type of attacks. And they said, well, we can't have that here. And I said, yes, you can. You can put us on a VLAN, right? So a physical port, you guys notice that when you were connecting and to the switch of RCCD, that is actually isolated the, from the rest of their traffic. Is it really truly isolated? No, it's still connected to that, but they can place a firewall to filter what's coming from a VLAN into. It needs to be routed into the regular network. You understand? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like a DMZ concept where, but it is logical. So on the network, you're still on that switch, right? That port is connected to the baby switch that's connected to everybody. But we take the logical port and then we identify it as a separate network using different IP addresses. So it needs to be routed in. And the way that we control that is to place a firewall there to say, okay, you coming from a VLAN, I'm gonna check you. I'm gonna check you for NAC. I'm gonna check you for all of these things. So the firewall is gonna go down the tool, right? But there are ways around that. If I'm coming in from the VLAN, I just need to tell the router that, or and, and the firewall that I'm already the system inside, right? It's kind of like showing your passport and you say, I'm a citizen in that country. I have all the records here. You don't need to check me again. So I'm in, right? Using the same credential and the identity of the system that's authenticated and the session that's already authenticated, they could talk from the VLAN into your regular network. And that's how it works. So bypassing my spoofing, MAC, IP, and other identities. <laughs> Seems easy, right? It is. <laughs> Question. Okay, so we are going to stop for a little bit of break. Let me stop my video so it's not 